The following program does not offer personal medical advice. Please consult your doctor before using any treatment or product we cover. Welcome to Go to Health Media with your host, Jonathan Marks. We provide a welcoming environment where experts educate you on important health topics, answer your questions, and provide information from which you can benefit in consultation with your doctor. You can visit and subscribe to the show at gotohealthmedia.com. And now, here is Jonathan Marks. Hey everyone, welcome back. This is Jonathan Marks with Go to Health. We have a difficult story today, but we're going to get through it. And there's some wonderful news at the end here. It's a parent's worst nightmare, losing your child so quickly to a disease for which there's no vaccine. Alicia Stillman lost her 19-year-old daughter, Emily, to meningitis in 2013, back when there was no approved vaccine for meningitis B. Patty Wukovitz also lost her daughter in 2012. Kimberly was a 17-year-old high school senior, just a week shy of graduation, when she also died from meningitis B. Stillman and Wukovitz transformed their grief, thankfully, into action, sharing their daughter's stories and advocating for recommended vaccines, including newly available vaccines that help protect against all five types of meningococcal bacteria most likely to cause meningitis. They are now co-executive directors of the American Society for Meningitis Prevention. With us to talk about this today is Alicia Stillman, co-executive director of the Society and director of the Emily Stillman Foundation. Over the past decade, she's worked to empower communities to take action to prevent meningococcal meningitis through education, policy, and vaccine equity initiatives, and by mobilizing a national network of advocates. She currently serves in the World Health Organization's task force to defeat meningitis by 2030. And in addition to her advocacy work, Alicia is the chief executive officer of a multi-state law firm based in Michigan. We also have Dr. Mary Koslep Petraco, a member of the Medical Council of the American Society for Meningitis Prevention. She is also a clinical assistant professor at Stony Brook University School of Nursing in Stony Brook, New York, and a primary care provider in her own private practice. She's nationally known expert in immunization practice and has been an advisor for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and served on the National Vaccine Advisory Committee. Welcome to the show, Mary and Alicia. How are you today? Hi, Jonathan. Thank you for having us today. So glad to have you. It's a pleasure to be here, Jonathan. Thank you. Good. So Mary, if you can tell us what is meningitis, how does it come on and who's most at risk if we know? Well, as a pediatric nurse practitioner, this is a really important topic for me to always discuss with my patients and their families. Meningitis is a severe, devastating bacterial infection of the coverings of the brain. We call them meninges, but they're the tissues that cover the outside of the brain and the spinal cord. And these bacteria get into this space and cause debilitating effects afterwards if you survive. It's a very fast-moving illness. It starts out with these vague symptoms like so many other illnesses, maybe a slight fever, a headache, just a general feeling of not well, maybe a little muscle aches, but it progresses extremely rapidly to severe symptoms of loss of consciousness, development of a of like a purplish rash that usually starts at the ankles and moves up. And it's because these toxins from the bacteria get into the blood and cause this, what we call petechiae or these little purplish rashes all over the body. It affects every single organ in the body it uh, causes multi-system organ failure. And if you survive, very often the survivors lose arms, legs, the skin almost looks like it's been burned because the toxin has gotten into the skin. So parts of the skin have to be removed. It can cause mental confusion, blindness, deafness. Mm. And unfortunately, too many people die from this devastating illness. And the only way to prevent it is through vaccination and vaccination wow. against all five serotypes. A, B, C, W, and Y. 
We have really effective vaccines these days to protect the, our most vulnerable. And the most vulnerable is because of their behaviors. Unfortunately, it's our adolescents who have these vulnerable behaviors because they put everything in their mouths, like our babies did, mm. and adolescents do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And and so if you have the vaccine, the, the, a parent doesn't have to be worried about a slight fever or a rash. <laughs> that, you know, what you described is, sounds very scary as a parent. You know, if somebody, you know, one of your kids starts developing a fever or rash or, you know, slight headache, could this be, um, you know, meningococcal bacteria? Well, no vaccine is 100% perfect. Actually, as providers, when we know that children have been vaccinated, that kind of like moves those serious illnesses like meningitis down that list of uh, potential diagnoses. The rash is a very different kind of rash. It's a rash like, I mean, most rashes are pink or a little scaly or something like this. This is purple. It looks almost like bruising. But what I usually tell parents is keep an eye on your children. You know, don't just say, oh, it's just a headache or it's just maybe they just don't feel that well today. Because the problem with this illness is it progresses very rapidly. So mm -hmm. if they have a fever and uh, maybe a headache, check on them. Don't just give them, you know, a, a fever relief reducer and send them off to bed and not check on them until the next morning. Go in and look at them. Take a see if they're any better. See if they're any worse. See if there there's any changes. Because like I said, this comes on very rapidly. So mm -hmm. if you see the child just well, I'm not feeling too well. And like an hour later, they're, you go and check on them and they look terrible. That's the time to really just get them out, get them to the healthcare provider immediately. But if you've had your child vaccinated, you'll hear Patty and Alicia talk about their girls. And they had a sense of comfort because they knew their girls were vaccinated. They didn't know that their children had meningitis B. There was no meningitis B vaccine at that time. Mm -hmm. So that was the big difference. Now, when we see children in the hospital these days, okay, they've been vaccinated against meningitis B. They've been vaccinated against measles. So we're going to move those things down further on the, our, our list of, of what the potentials are. And it, fewer devastating illnesses. All of the illnesses that we can protect children against with vaccines can potentially be devastating. And one of them that's at the top of the list, unfortunately, is bacterial meningitis. Got it. How many times do you have to get the vaccine? Is it once or do you have to get it every year like the flu? How often do we get it? Well, the meningitis vaccines last about three to four years. And that's why we give it at the at the age ages where we do give them because we, we look to see where the children are most at risk. Honestly, we haven't seen in the adolescent group any meningitis that's caused by A, C, W, or Y in years because the children get the vaccine when they are 11 to 12 years of age, and then they okay. get another dose after their 15th birthday. The one that we have seen is meningitis B. Meningitis B is the only meningitis that we've seen on the college campuses in over mm -hmm. 10 years. So mm -hmm. what this says to us is, we need to be looking at getting these vaccines into these children. I wish we had more of them vaccinated. We do see a higher number who get the meningitis ACWY because many of the schools require that for 11 to 12 year olds and then require it again when they're after the 15th birthday. Meningitis B is not mandatory. So some providers don't even bring it up because they figure, oh, it's not that common. I got so many other things to talk about. But mm -hmm. if it's your child or my child, it's yeah. important. I would feel terrible if I didn't bring this this up and discuss this with all of my families. If I lost a child, what kind of a provider would I be? So I take that minute or two to say, hey, there's this meningitis B. I, we've given the meningitis, uh, we've covered your child against these other strains. There's this other strain. And the, that's what the parents need to know, that their children are protected against all five strains. Not just four, but all five strains. Okay. And you mentioned starting at 11. What happens? Uh, yeah, I usually think of vaccines happening when, you know, kids are babies. And then why is it only, why are people only susceptible to this when they're like at 11 years old? Well, the reason why 11 years old is because we think babies are the only ones who put things in their mouths. Mm -hmm. Well, our adolescents put things in their mouths too. <laughs> When they get to a little older, they start sharing things. They share gum. Mm. I, oh, I saw kids in the mall once sharing a wad of chewing gum. Oof. We, don't, we think they don't do stuff like that. They share forks and knives. They share food. They share uh, water bottles. They right. share when they get they share joints. 
They share, share lots of things. That sharing of saliva. Saliva is where this bacteria is found. They hug each other. They get in each other's faces. So that's why they are more at risk. And that's why the vaccine is geared towards that adolescent community. Got it. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. That's very helpful advice. Alicia, first of all, I want to say how sorry I am for your loss. I know it's been a while, but I'm sure it's tough. And I have so much respect for the action that you took in starting this new organization called Meningitis Prevention. Um, and it's just Thank so you. we know, it's meningitisprevention.org. That's where you can go to learn more. So Alicia, tell us about Emily and why you became a vaccine advocate to educate other parents. With pleasure, Jonathan. I love to talk about Emily. Emily was 19 years old. She was my middle daughter. In 2013, she was a college sophomore at a small liberal arts college. She called home one night with a headache, just a headache. I thought perhaps she was coming down with the flu. She thought perhaps she was up all night studying the night before. She said, you know how I get when I get overtired. Yeah. We decided that she would take Motrin and go to bed. For Emily, the next morning never came because she woke up a few hours later and she said to her sweet mates, my head really hurts. I think I should go to the hospital. But she walked into the hospital. She walked in with her backpack, her phone, her computer, a textbook. She walked in and they treated her simply for a headache. She mm. had been vaccinated for bacterial meningitis. As, as Dr. Koslep Petraco said, it was down on the list. She had been vaccinated with the ACWI vaccine at age 11 and then again before she went to college. Mm. As the evening became next, the next morning, her, her mood began to change. She was confused, even combative. And that's when they began to suspect bacterial meningitis. Mm -hmm. When I was contacted the next day, they had already prepared Emily for a craniotomy. The swelling in her brain was so severe that if she would survive, they said, the swelling would be so bad that the degree of brain damage would be just horrible. They wanted to lessen that. Yeah. When they told me she had bacterial meningitis, I remember saying, there's no way she was vaccinated against bacterial meningitis. Right. They said, just get to the hospital and we'll explain everything. When I got to the hospital, she was already in surgery for her to have a craniotomy. She never woke up. She never... I never got to see her eyes again. I never got to feel her hug me again. This, the swelling was so severe that it caused a brain death. And within 24 hours, 25 hours, Emily was, was brain dead. Mm. And I said goodbye to my daughter on a very, very cold February morning. And I, I said, you go, you be at peace. I'm going to figure this out. I didn't understand. I could hardly say the word meningococcal, let alone spell it. And I certainly didn't know that there were different zero groups. Mm -hmm. When I said goodbye, I said, I'm going to figure this out and I will make sure this doesn't happen in other families. I created the Emily Stillman Foundation in her memory to raise awareness for bacterial meningitis and also organ and tissue donation because we made the decision for my daughter to become a hero. In 2017, um, I partnered with Patty Wukovitz on Long Island, New York, who had also created a foundation in memory of her daughter, Kimberly Coffey. She died while she was still living home. You see, this is not just a college disease. Mm -hmm. She was still living at home with her mom. And she also had been protected with a with a vaccine for A, C, W, and Y. But again, that was 2012, and the MEN-B vaccine was not yet licensed in the United States. We worked it with the Meningitis B Action Project for several years, and we realized that the landscape, the meningitis landscape, is so confusing and, and, and so uh, volatile, it's constantly changing, mm -hmm 
in good ways where new vaccines are introduced and where the ACIP of, of the CDC are, are revisiting um, what the current recommendations are as we speak. And we knew that it couldn't just say the meningitis B action project. It needed to be more all encompassing. Right. And this year we rebranded as the American Society for Meningitis Prevention. Yes. And we do fabulous work all over the world that we're very proud of. We have a plethora of resources available on our website, meningitisprevention.org. Our unbranded resources are being utilized on college campuses, in hospital systems, in providers' offices. Our goal is to educate. Our goal is to empower the patients themselves, the adolescents and young adults, the parents, the healthcare providers, the school systems, the colleges, policymakers. We, we want to educate and empower everybody so that when you meet with your healthcare provider, you can be specific and you can ask the question, has my child or have I been protected against all five zero groups of preventable bacteria. It's very important because the protection is available now and it wasn't available for me to protect my daughter mm -hmm. and it wasn't available to Patty to protect Kimberly, but it is now. And we just need everybody to understand and become empowered and ask for it when they meet with their provider. Great. Thank you. Mary, let me ask a question. When a child does get vaccinated, are they automatically vaccinated for all five different types of virus or, or bacteria, or do you have to ask for all five? That's a terrific question. Unfortunately, you need to ask for all five because mm. the regular meningitis vaccine that children get at 11 to 12 years of age, and then the, the one that, that Alicia's daughter, Emily, had is the routine one. The meningitis B part is what we call shared decision making because it is a rare disease and it's expensive vaccine. We as healthcare providers are expected to talk to parents, to tell them about meningitis B, yes. tell them what the risks are. And then between the parent and the provider, the decision is made whether or not to get the meningitis B vaccine. Okay. Honest to goodness, after I get finished talking with parents, I haven't had a parent yet who's refused the meningitis B vaccine. But it's not something that is just an automatic. It's something mm -hmm. that either the provider has to bring up or the parent has to bring up. And like Alicia mentioned to you, the purpose of her organization is to educate both providers and parents so that nobody falls through the cracks. I see patients myself, you have so much stuff to cover in a short amount of time. You don't want to miss anything. And it's like, oh, is this the really most important thing I need to talk about? Because not a lot of how, a whole lot of kids are going to get this. Right. No, but if it's your child or my child, it's a lot of children. So if the, if the provider forgets or doesn't bring it up, then the parent needs to be educated to ask for it. It's really an important thing to do. I mean, I, as a provider, I would feel terrible if, God forbid, a child I was caring for came down with meningitis B and I didn't discuss it with the parent and offer it. Got so it. again, you know, it's it's tough. It's tough out there being a provider, uh, a healthcare provider taking care of children. You got a lot of stuff, you got a lot of ground to cover. Yes. But if, if there's something slips through the cracks, the parent needs to be the advocate for the child and say, how many, I want my child protected against all five strains. Yes. That's the message. I want my child protected against all five strains. Is that just one injection or is it five injections? I mean, are they all combined in one injection? Well, we have different formulations and that can okay. be very confusing for parents. Alicia, before I go on, did you want to add something? I just wanted to add because um, Dr. Kessler Petraco made the comment that it is expensive and it is, you know, to me, it's worth its weight in gold, but it is covered under VFC, vaccines for children and all private insurance companies. So I just wanted to clarify that too, that it's not an out-of-pocket vaccine. Yeah. So let me ask a question, particularly for you, Alicia, and what you tell parents, because I know there can be a lot of hesitation about vaccines and are they effective? Do they have side effects? Da, 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 da. We've been through all that. What do you tell parents who are you know, concerned about or reluctant to get their kids vaccinated in different ways? What do you say? I would give anything in the world for my daughter to still be here. 
I couldn't protect my daughter against all five zero groups. Yes. You can. That's what I tell parents. It's really important. Good. That's that's good enough. Is just get vaccinated. Don't take the risk. Yes. Yeah. And this comes on. What's amazing is it this comes on so suddenly. That's really the scary thing about it. That, that you know you you talked about your daughter. You know, just being at college and you know, just getting sick overnight and then having to go to the hospital it's, and passing. And oftentimes, you know, it, it, it comes on so suddenly and quite often it's misdiagnosed mm -hmm. because, you know, a young, a college student, for example, may think that they have a hangover. Yes. It, it might be, you know, all those things it, it are not, all these symptoms are not present at the same time in all cases. But like my Emily just had a headache. She did yeah. not run a fever. Mm -hmm. Patty's daughter did run a fever. She had she started to develop the rash. Yes. So not all symptoms are the same and yes. not all symptoms are present at all times. Got so it. it is important. It's even if a, a young person has been vaccinated, it is important to be aware of the symptoms and be aware of the risks. Mary, is there a way for doctors or clinicians to tell that this is meningitis early on so that they don't so they they don't misdiagnose or miss something? I wish there was, but the only way to make the de the definitive diagnosis is with the cultures. And that's but like Alicia mentioned to you how quickly the symptoms progress. Yes. If you start seeing some a real fast progression like this, don't wait. You've got to get to the hospital as quickly as possible. But the bottom line for us is education that it's prevention. It's so much better to prevent this than yes. to have to treat it. And when I mentioned about because insurance companies balk at paying for expensive vaccines to prevent a few cases a year. And that's my from my perspective as a public health nurse with the with the cost of the vaccines yes. yes it's covered but we don't want the insurance companies to turn around and say oh there's not a whole lot of people getting this so we're not going to pay for it anymore i don't ever want to see that happen the bottom line is prevention is the best way to avoid this illness and making sure that your child the prevention includes all five serotypes because yes no vaccine is 100 percent effective but right. if your child's been vaccinated there's much less chance that that's, your child is going to suffer from this devastating disease. Got it. And so the major form of prevention is vaccination. It's not changing yes, it your is. child's behavior. You, you asked it's, before it's, about it's how many doses. You yes, asked before, I did. But, you know, I think that can be confusing for parents. All of the vaccines take several doses in order to get. It depends on which brand you use, which vaccine you're using, whether it's one dose or two doses, whether or not you need to get the vaccine again because you're still at risk. These are all questions that you could discuss with your provider. And like I said, it can be very confusing for parents. The message that we need to get to parents is protect your child against all yeah. five serotypes. Have Great. that conversation with your healthcare provider. Wonderful. Thank you. I really appreciate this message. Is there any particular time of year that this happens or can it happen any time of year? I know, you know, the flu we usually think of in the fall, but is this a year round kind of thing? Or it Unfortunately, it's year round. Year round. Okay, good. All right. Thank you so much for this information. We will get this out to as many people as possible. Again, we've been talking with Alicia Stillman, who co-founded the American Society for Meningitis Prevention. Tell us the website again. Meningitisprevention.org. Got it. Great. So Alicia Stillman and also Dr. Mary Koslet Petreko. She's a member of the Medical Council of the American Society for Meningitis Prevention. She's also a clinical assistant professor at Stony Brook University. Thanks so much for being with us both today. God bless you and your work, and let's keep all our kids safe. Thank Take you, care. Jonathan. My Thank pleasure. Thank you, Jonathan. Yes, my pleasure to be with you. And as we say at the end of every show, go to health. Take care. We'll see you again next time. Bye. Thank you for tuning in this week to Go To Health Media. Be sure to join Jonathan Marks and another health expert next time. You can also catch the program on your favorite podcast platform. Until our next show, be sure to visit us on the web at gotohealthmedia.com and elevate your life.